Welcome. My name is Quinn Golden, and I'm a storyteller, and I'm here to share some stories with you this evening. I can be found online and on Facebook at Leatherbound Journeys, if you're interested in, in looking for me. I'd like to share some, some stories tonight over maybe just a, a cup of tea and share and, and talk about some of our own traditions and storytelling. The first story I'd like to tell you this evening is a story by Jeffrey Levin. Now, Jeffrey Levin was a marvelous storyteller. He was also an actor of stage and screen, made a lot of movies, but we lost Jeffrey a few years ago. But he loved to tell stories. And one of his stories that I really enjoy telling is called Roller Rink. One summer, when I was a boy, my parents thought that I needed to spend some time at my grandparents out in the country. And I boarded the bus and I rode all by myself. I felt so proud sitting in the bus, looking out the window and watching the city pass away. Then we were in the country. Looking out of the window, I saw the, the pristine green hills off in the distance. I could see all the way to the horizon and anything felt like it was possible. Crossing a bridge, clear, cold water, reflected like flecks of gold in the bottom of a pond. Saw cows bowing their heads in the pasture. I ate the sandwich my mother made for me. And about afternoon or so, the bus pulled up and stopped in this little four-corner town out in the middle of nowhere. The bus driver said that was my stop, and, and I got off. Oh, and the air was clear and the sun was so bright on the tips of the corn just starting to come up. Birds and bugs and even a little frog had come out to greet me. And over there, leaning up against the hood of my grandpa's pickup truck, were my grandparents. Oh, I was so excited. I waved and run over and the bus driver had to call me back. Hey boy, you want your luggage? <laughs> I was so excited. I rode out to the farm in the back of the pickup truck that day. Oh, that summer I learned to swim in Miller's Pond. I watched a calf being born on the farm. I got to ride on the hay cutter with my grandpa. The two big field horses, Dolly and Bess, they pulled it right along. Yeah, we, we stopped though for every 20 minutes or so and let them cool off and rest in the shade. It was so hot that year. I, I helped the hired hands bring in the cows at night. And I get up early in the morning and I, I helped them milk them too and then turn them out. I watched clouds change shape in the skies as the afternoon thunderstorms rolled in. I remember leaning in the hot sun, sitting in the grass, chewing on a piece of straw. I watched a snake swim across the stock pond. And every evening, uh, when, uh, every Wednesday night after the dis dinner dishes was done, we'd all pile into my grandpa's truck and we'd go into town because they had a roller rink. Oh, I love the roller rink. I'd sit on that little bench there beside the skate rental counter and my grandpa would, would rent me a pair of skates and, and my grandmother would help me lace them on and she'd put them on real tight, you know. And then I'd skate around and around under the rows of Christmas lights set no one ever seemed to take down. The place was old and gray, uh, gray and green. The air was stale and the paint was chipping and lots of folks said that, you know, it'll just all be torn down anyway. Oh, but not me. I love the roller rink. I'd skate around and around. There was posters on the walls of events that happened long ago. Well, some of them was ripped, but most of them you could still read. And every time I'd go around, sitting right on that little bench, those little bleachers over there in the corner, both wearing hats, shoulders touching, holding hands, it would be my grandparents. And every time I'd skate by, they'd pick up their free hand and they'd wave at me. And I'd wave back and I'd keep going. And you know, at those moments in time, everything just fit. Everything felt together. Do you know what I mean? Well, the summer evolved and 
nights got colder and some leaves started to fall and one day we got up really early and, and my grandma made a huge breakfast for all the hired hands to come in and the neighbors come over and well it was my day to leave and my grandpa he, he took me back to that town and he put me back on the bus and I rode back to the city all by myself well, only this time I, I didn't feel all grown up I I felt sad looking out the window watching the pristine green and countryside and the rich gravel roads fade away to the grime of the city. I had tears streaming down my face. Well, that winter there was a, there was a shooting in my neighborhood and a robbery and, and, and some people got hurt and I just, I, things was changing and I couldn't understand how and I couldn't understand why. But, but I, I grew up and, and, and I went on into school and, and, and did okay and, and got into college and well then some things happened around the world and, and, and I decided to leave and, and go in the army and, and I went overseas and, and did, did what they taught me to do and well I came back home and it was all right and my friends didn't all come home but I did and, and I got married and, and met this wonderful nice gal back in school and, and, and we grew up and, and graduated and and get this little house out in the suburbs and I started writing novels and, and, and we had a couple children, had twins, a boy and a girl and things were going pretty well but th then I, I lost my wife when, when, when she got, got hit by a drunk driver and I, I had to quit writing my novel and take a second job so my kids would be okay but, but they were okay, they, 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 we get them off and, and when they got old enough we sold that little, that little house in the suburbs and, and put my kids into school and I moved into this apartment in the city where I where I sit and, and I live now. Well, they did a couple of years into school, uh, some things happened and, and my son, she, you know, had to be just like dad. He, uh, he, went, he went and enlisted in the service too and, and went overseas, but he, he, he didn't come home. And my daughter, she went to school out in California and met a fine fella, a good, good, nice, nice guy. And they, they're doing well. They have, they have two kids of their own now. And I got to see them a year or so ago, too. And, oh, they're fine. They're fine kids. And, but now I, I sit here and my, you know, my, my work is kind of done. And, and I, I sit here and I, I think about my wife and my too short career and, and my friends I've had along the ways. And I... I, I look at these pictures on the walls a lot, a great deal. I spend a lot of time looking at these pictures. Well, one, one particularly gray day, I, I got up and I, I locked the apartment. And I, I went down and got on a bus. And I took that bus back out to that little four-corner town in the middle of nowhere by my grandpa's farm. It was long past dark when I got to the roller rink. The door opened real easy. I went inside and cut the light switch and the old lights came on. The place hadn't changed a bit. It was still green paint was peeling. The air was still stale, but somehow all these things was comforting to me. The, the bench was still there in the, in the rental counter and I walked around the back of it and looked and <laughs> I found some skates back there that, that actually fit me. And, and I sat down on that bench and and, and I, I put them on and I laced them up real tight, you know. And then I stood up and I pushed off. And it come kind of hard at first, but then, then it kind of got easier and, and, and I started skating. And I started skating around and around under the rows of Christmas lights that no one had ever bothered to take down. The air was stale, and the old posters still on the wall, ripped and torn, but a lot of them you could still read. And as I skated around, over there, with them two little bleachers, holding hands, shoulders touching, both wearing hats, were my grandparents. And as I skated around for the last time, they waved to me. And suddenly, everything in the world was reconnected and felt possible. That was Roller Rink by Jeffrey Lewis. Now here in the Northeast, we have the Christmas tree, we have holly and mistletoe, but we, we also have the poinsettia. 
Now, the poinsettia is not traditionally a plant here in, in, in New England. It doesn't grow here in the wild. It comes from Mexico. And its tradition in Mexico goes back a very, very long way, far farther back than what well, we've had them here in New England. We've only had them here in New England as long as technology has allowed us to bring them up here and, uh, and to grow them in our, in our houses. But the story, the miracle of the poinsettia, goes back to the early 1800s. And it goes all the way back to a little town in Mexico. Now, in this town, it was always a tradition for people to get together and honor the baby Jesus. And they would bring gifts and say prayers to the baby Jesus on Christmas Eve. So all during the, uh, the Christmas season, all during December, each week at church, they would build a portion of the nativity. And the sermon that week would be involving around whatever portion of the nativity was, was being brought in that week. One week would be the animals and, and the building and Mary and Joseph. And it would all be cumulated on Christmas Eve with the baby Jesus, who would then be, be brought in himself. Well, little Maria lived in that town. She was a little peasant girl. And she badly wanted to go and see the baby Jesus but she had no gifts to bring, and she had no way to go out and procure any gifts or buy any gifts. And she was very, very, very upset about this. Now, one of her little friends had told her that she had seen the baby Jesus before. And when she was at the church, she noticed that it was lying in the crèche on a bed of straw, and it had no blanket. So little Maria thought she could maybe knit and crochet a blanket and she tried hard all through the week to try to, to put this blanket together and, and alas, she was unable to do it. And then the day came to go to see the baby Jesus at the church and she was very, very upset. Well, she went to the church and, and she stayed outside while all the rest of the people were in line waiting to go in. And she hung around and she didn't, and well, some of the church ladies said, what's the matter, Maria? You, you were very sad. And she replied, well, I can't go in to see the baby Jesus because I have no gift to bring. Well, they, they felt pity for her and they said, well, it's okay. You can come in. You are the gift child. You can come in anyway. But, but Maria, she just couldn't do it. And she looked around at the ladies that were all in line and, and they had, they had, plates of food, and they had blankets, and they had all these gifts that they had brought because they would present them to the baby Jesus, say their prayer, and, and pray for good tidings to come during the year. And, and then afterwards, all of those gifts, those items, would be dispersed amongst the villages that needed them. And, and Maria, she just couldn't participate. But one of the ladies was standing over her, and as she stood by her, she discovered one of a leaf had fallen out of the plant that the bouquet of flowers that she was holding. And it dropped on down and dropped on the ground. And Maria thought to herself, well, maybe I could give this leaf. Maybe this leaf would be a, a good gift for the baby Jesus. And she had it in her hand and she thought, well, I, I can't hold it in my hand because my hand, it'll, it'll, it'll get damaged, it'll get destroyed. And she remembered that she always had her handkerchief with her. And because her grandmother, had given her the handkerchief and told her that she should always keep the handkerchief with her because the lady should carry one. And it was a gift from her grandmother. So she, she took the leaf and she put the handkerchief in her hand and she so carefully put the leaf inside of the handkerchief. And she wrapped it up and she wrapped it and she held it tight and she held it into her, into her little hands so nothing could happen to it. And she hung right onto it and she stood in line and she stood in, and then when they entered the church, she stood near the back of the church, and, and she let everybody else go first, and, and she kind of hung back, and all the other ladies, they all went through, and they all, they all gave their gifts and stuff to the baby Jesus, and finally it was her turn. And she went up to the altar, and she knelt down, and she said her prayer, and she crossed herself, and she stood up, and all the church ladies watched as she held out her little hand to, to give that simple leaf the simple leaf as the gift. And they watched her as she unrolled her little handkerchief. And that simple leaf had turned in to a beautiful red star-shaped flower. It was a shape like the day, like the star in the sky. 
And the words of the Christmas miracle spread throughout the church and it spread throughout the village and spread throughout the land. And ever since then, to this day, the poinsettia is considered to be the flower of the Holy Spirit. And that is the legend of the poinsettia and how it came to be part of Christmas and part of our Christmas here in, in the Northeast. Lots of stories invoke memories and memories of, of time and memories of childhood and memories of our past. And there's one particular story it was written by a man named Jeffrey Lewis that I follow and I'm a fan of. And I always try to tell some of his stories, uh, particularly in the Christmas season, because he was a marvelous storyteller. Now you might remember the name Jeffrey Lewis. Uh, he was an actor, stage and screen. He was friends of Clint Eastwood. He did a lot of walk-on roles. Uh, he was in a lot of Westerns. If you remember the movie, Every Which Way But Loose, he was the fellow that owned the orangutan. So he was a wonderful actor. We lost Jeffrey a few years ago, but he was a marvelous storyteller, and he absolutely loved to tell stories. And one of his stories is called The Train, and it's a Christmas story. The train rolled through the countryside, and I sat on it, looking out the window at the houses far off in the distance, I could see them every now and again turning on their lights against the long, cold winter's night. Two thick-coated horses eating hay in the almost dark, steam coming out of their nostrils, and then they were gone. The stars were bright and crisp in the now cold, dark sky. It wasn't very warm on the train. At the far end of the car, a man was sitting and he had his coat kind of rolled up under his head, you know, for a pillow. A small gift had tumbled down and was setting in the aisle. Across the aisle from me, a few seats away, a woman sat with her baby. And she sat there looking out the window and she saw me, my reflection in her window, looking at her and she kind of smiled at my reflection and then looked onto the window at the darkness that was slipping by. Well, I settled back into my seat and I pulled my thick, heavy coat up around me and, and settled back to look out my window and then I heard a, a soft, oh, sound. And looking over, I, I saw her sitting in her seat with her baby and hold her baby to her very close and very tight. And suddenly, I felt very close and very warm and a door opened in the back of my mind and I opened it and light flooded in. And I heard my father's voice say, it's cold out there. You put that log right on the fire. We're gonna need that tonight. I stepped into my childhood living room and my father closed the door behind me. The tree was already decorated over by the front window. Upstairs, I heard the raucous sounds of laughter coming from my older cousins. The, and my mother, she came out of the kitchen carrying a tray of red and green iced cookies. Oh, and behind her, behind her came the aroma of roasted turkey that wrapped around my head like a gauze. My little sister and two of her cousins were laying on the floor in front of the Christmas tree, staring at the gifts, like a shark stares at a man's legs hanging in the water, trying to see beyond the wrappings and all the pretty tinsel. I went over and put the wood in the wood box and took off my gloves and was warming my frozen hands in front of the fire. I, I could hear the sounds of somebody stamping snow off of their boots on the back porch. I looked over at my living room and I could see my grandfather in there with my grandmother. She was scolding him, telling him the proper way to shell the walnuts, which he was already shelling. <laughs> he just looked at me and smiled and shrugged his shoulders and went right back to shelling the walnuts. Well, I went over to stand beside my aunt who had called me over to sing the tenor part around the piano. and We were all singing and having a good time and I could hear laughter coming out of the kitchen where the windows were all steamed up. We were singing our songs and uh, we sounded pretty good, I think. We were sometimes forgetting the second and third verses. 
And somewhere in all the din of the singing and the laughter and the holiday, I heard the sound of someone crying. I, I looked around trying to find the source of that sound. And, and I looked and, and I looked. And then as the sights and sights and sounds of my childhood living room spun out of my mind, my eyes fell on to the woman back in the train, sitting across the aisle a few seats away. She was, she was holding her baby very tight to her. And it was then that I, I, I noticed that her eyes were filled with tears, to, so she couldn't even see the seat back that was in front of her. And the sweater she was wearing was very threadbare. At one time it was probably warm, but that was a very long time ago. And she was trying to pull that sweater, pull it up and around her, hold her baby. I get up and, and walked between the seats in the swaying car. And when I got up to her, I, I took off my own warm coat. And I reached over and I draped it, draped it over her shoulders. And I sat down beside her. And I took her free hand and I warmed it in mine. And we sat there, looking straight ahead, neither one of us talking. And after a short time, under her breath, I heard her say, Merry Christmas. And the train slid along across the dark, quiet, and sleeping landscape. That's The Train by Jeffrey Lewis. That's one of my favorite stories to tell, and I hope that you enjoy it. But we're here tonight having a cup of Christmas tea, which is another great story. A Cup of Christmas Tea is a contemporary story written by Tom Haig, and this is available at bookstores everywhere. It's an excellent story, and I thought I would like to share that one with you this evening as well. The log was in the fireplace, all spiced and set to burn. It seemed the annual Christmas race was in the clubhouse turn. The cards were in the mail, gifts under the tree, and a 30-day reprieve before Visa could catch up with me. <laughs> Although smug satisfaction should have been the order of the day, something was fairly nagging at me, and, and it would not go away. You see, a week before, I got a letter from my old great aunt. And she wrote, of course, I'll understand completely if you can't, but if you find you have some time, how wonderful it would be if we could maybe have a chat and share a cup of Christmas tea. You see, she'd had a mild stroke that year and it had crippled her left side. Though housebound now, my folks had said it hadn't hurt her pride. They said she'd love to see you and, and how nice it would be if you could go and have that cup of Christmas tea. Oh, oh boy, I did not want to go. Oh, what a bitter pill to see an aged family member that had gone so far downhill. I, 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 I remembered her as vigorous, as funny, and as bright. I remembered Christmas Eve when she regaled us half the night. I did not want to lose all that. I, I didn't want the pain. I didn't need the depression. I, I didn't need the strain. And what about my brother? What about him? Why well, can't he go? It's, it's his aunt too. I thought I had it justified, but then uh, before I knew all the reasons I painstakingly built not to go, were cracking wide and crumbling in an acid rain of guilt. So I put on my coat and gloves and a cap, and shame stinging every pore. I armed with a snow brush, sand, and a map, I headed out the front door. I, I drove in from the suburbs out to the older part of town, out the pastels of the newer houses gave way to grays and browns. I had a disembodied feeling as the car pulled up and stopped outside of the little wooden house that housed the Christmas cup. How I 
got up to her front door, I, I really cannot tell. I, I watched my arm as if from afar rise up and my hand ring the bell. I, I stood there, aided, nervous in my rocking to and fro. And just, just as I thought to myself, I, that's it, I, I need to turn and go. I heard the familiar rattle of the china in the hutch on the wall and then the triple beat of two feet and a crutch come down the hall. The clicking of the lock and the sliding of the bolt and with a little swollen jolt, the door popped open. I, there she stood looking tiny and pale and fragile as an egg. I had to work hard to keep from staring at the brace that held her leg. Though her thick bifocal seemed to crack and spread her eyes, their milky and refractive depths lit up in youthful surprise. Come in, come in, she sang the words and grabbed me by the hand. I, all of my fears dissolved as if by her command. I, we went inside and I closed the door. And before I knew how to react, I looked around at Christmas past, alive, intact. <laughs> this, the scent of candied oranges, of cinnamon, of pine, the, the little wooden soldiers in their military line, the porcelain nativity I'd always loved so much, the Dresden and the crystal that I'd been told I mustn't touch. Like magic, I was six again, trapped in a Christmas spell, steeped in a million memories that the boy inside knew well. And there, amongst the Christmas cards, so lovingly displayed, a place of special honor for the ones we kids had made. And here, beside her rocking chair, at the center of it all, my great aunt stood and said how nice it was I'd come to call. <laughs> I sat and prattled on about the weather and the flu and she listened very patiently and then she said, so what's new? <laughs> Thoughts and words began to flow and suddenly I, I, I started making sense. I lost that phony breeziness that I use when I get tense. She was still passionately interested in everything I did. And she, she was uplifting, she was positive and encouraging, like when I was a kid. And simple generalities, oh, that still threw her into fits. She demanded the particulars, the specifics, the bits. And we talked about the limitations that, that she'd had to face. And she spoke with utter candor and with humor and good grace. And then, defying the reality of crutch and straightened knee, on wings of hospitality, she flew off to make the tea. <laughs> I sat alone now with feelings feelings I had not felt in years. I looked around at Christmas through a thick hot blur of tears. The candles and the holly that she'd arranged on every shelf. The, the, the impossibly good cookies that she still somehow baked herself. <laughs> Yet all of these real and tangible memories measured quite pale and thin when compared to the Christmas that my great aunt kept within. Her body halved and nearly spent, but my great aunt was whole. I saw a Christmas miracle, a triumph of a soul. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch come down the hall, the old familiar rattle of the china and the hutch against the wall. She poured two cups and handed one to me. And then we shared a cup 
of Christmas tea. Thank you. That was A Cup of Christmas Tea by Tom Haig, and it's a wonderful, marvelous story. I'd like to thank you very much for coming and listening to my stories and sharing our time together this evening. Thank you.